Welcome to Tom's Alignment Shop. Ah, there's a first time for everything. Okay, last week I left off with this fixture. This is the one that hangs on the back of the engine bay latch. And it's this connection here that I didn't quite have done last week. Since then, in my own time or kind of off camera or whatever, I completed these with the CNC machine. It's got a lot of adjustability on the back. There's four different holes here. It can go up and down. These holes are slotted so I can get the strings in the center of the hub of the wheel. And then it has these nylon um, bolts here that prevent this tube from sliding but i can slide this tube relative to the end to get the center of the car relative to the center of the strings dialed in so i did that for both front and rear so i'm, I'm kind of getting a late start this week but i do want to try the tools and show you how they work okay the scales are laid out here on the floor i'm going to connect them up with the controller lr by intercomp this is the left rear so i got them all laid out correctly So I'm just gonna step on each of the scales and see if they work. So this is the right front. Right front, that looks right. Uh, now you know my weight, 183. Again, 184. We'll go left rear. I can't really see it, but I, the camera should pick it up. 184, hopefully. right rear also all the scales are working correctly now we just need to make sure that they are level so i'm going to get out the same tools i used for my suspension alignment this is what i use for leveling over long distances like the entire wheelbase this is an aluminum channel and i've just welded the ends shut on there so it will hold liquid and so I'm gonna put Windex in here. It's gonna span from front to rear, like that with liquid. And then there's another one that goes from left to right. I do support the middle. This does not affect the measurement. It just keeps the aluminum from sagging. So. Okay, that's flat against the scale. And then we just put the fluid in. I like Windex because it has really low surface tension. As long as the liquid is continuous between left and right and front and back, this will give you a very accurate measurement. Then what I do, I have a cut off piece of tape measure. I'm using the millimeter side and I just shine the flashlight here right on the liquid. This one's eight and this one's seven. Now, the fact that they're different heights is only because there's more liquid in this one than there is this one. So I can check over here. If this is eight, then I'm good to go. But it's not, it's way less. This one's only five, seven and a half. So front to back, it's perfectly level, but left to right, it is not. I found this big sheet of plastic. I'm gonna put this under the scale now, unfortunately, this is gonna disturb my front to back, which means I gotta put the same amount underneath this scale as I do that one. Five. So now I was able to get these three essentially level. So now we'll check it in this L direction. It's likely the liquid's gonna spill as I move it over, just trying to spill it on the scales. Okay, nothing special about this level. This is just a cheap one from the hardware store. There are something called engineering levels that are actually very precise. This, I don't expect a whole lot out of, but let's just see what it says. Right between the lines. And then if you do use a level, it's always good practice to swap it. 
from end to end and see if there's any differences. Still right, right between the lines. So both methods agree. My feeling is that the tape measure method is more accurate because if you think about the positioning of this bubble inside this long frame, it could be off by a fraction of a degree, whereas measuring at the ends, there's no measurement error. It's basically you get what you get, there's no error. Both are agreeing here, but uh, you know whatever you're using, just make sure you're comfortable with it. And then in this direction, I'm not able to check because it's just not long enough. So you would need a really long level and that's where it gets a little bit more dicey. Five and a half and five. Great in this direction. Let's check this direction. So I'm just gonna write with a paint marker. This is plus three millimeters here. And this is plus three millimeters right here. So one millimeter, I'm able to read about half a millimeter. Worst case, one millimeter is about 40 thousandths of an inch. So these scales are level to within 40 thousandths of an inch. And because they're now marked, when I do this again for the next alignment, I just put the same shims underneath and I don't have to measure it every single time. Once I put the car in the same place, dictated by the lift, it's going to be the same every time. Okay, the car's on. It's a little dicey getting it on with that ramp method. I don't think I'll do that again. But that's just to get it on the scales. Now we can see how much the car weighs. Guess I should take the car cover off before I take a look. The total is less than I thought. Try to avoid the glare here. But if you can tell, I have a total of 1,887 pounds divided by 2.205, 855.8 kilograms. So 856 kilograms is the weight. Um, you know, it is what it is. I didn't do a whole lot of lightning on this car. You know, you can spend a lot of money to make things lighter. I didn't do that. This is a budget build. I don't have a lot of money in this car. The real reason why it's so light is because the 912 engine is probably in the, I'll look it up, I think it's in the 250 pound range, whereas a 911 engine is almost 400 pounds. So there's definitely like a 150 pound difference. So if you added um, 150 pounds, so 887 plus 150, that gets it in the 200, 2,040 pound range, which is pretty good even with a 911 engine. So depending on, what uh, accessories go in the 911 engine, it could go up to 2,100 pounds. But anyways, that's uh, not bad considering there is a roll bar in this car, you know, inch and a half DOM tubing. There's, I didn't weigh it, but it's probably in the, I'm just guessing like 60 pound range of just uh, roll bar material. Okay, lift it up the rear because I want to try these slip plates and see how well they work. So I'm going to just tuck them underneath here. And this is what I should have done instead of rolling it up on the ramps. I really should have just lifted it with the slip plates and then dropped it down. But I'm gonna look at the scales and see how it differs and if the slip plates are working. We should see those slip plates slipping.
So it slipped probably a full inch. And I'm going to open the door and just shake it a little bit. Let's see it slipping on there. I can move the whole car with just my hands. So it's very slippery. Over 1,100 pounds, and I'm able to just pull it with my hands. That's what the slip plates are for. That's what allows it to completely relax uh, when you drop it off the jack. So I'm gonna look at the numbers and see how the balance changed with the slip plates. Here's the, the numbers before I had, um, this is the rear. So the car would be like this, front and rear. This is before slip plates, this is after slip plates. So I had 562 on this left corner. I'm getting 566 after the slip plates. 579, 584. The weights actually went up a little bit on the rear. Um, the fronts basically stayed the same, but the difference between rolling the car on versus uh, using the slip plates and a jack is basically the same within five pounds, which tells me the slip plates are working. So this will fit up here tight. So I've got all these feet here touching. So I'm, I'm just putting a little bit of pressure on it. The bubble's not moving at all when I push on it. Um, so I have this here, this is for the caster, but it also tells me the camber is nice and level. So now I can take a reading, um, negative camber. It says to read the camber at the center of the bubble. So it's a lot, which is what I expected. It's um, two and it's over two and a half. It's two and three quarters, two and three quarters degrees. And then one thing I wanted to try with this gauge is to, like you do with any bubble level, you can switch the orientation so that if there's an air, you'll, you'll know. So I should get the same reading even if this gauge is put on upside down. So I'm just gonna do that real quick. So now it's upside down. I'm getting pretty much the same reading, um, slightly less, slightly less. So what that means is I would need to shim the bottom out just a little bit, just like that. So put a little piece of shim underneath here, and then that'll make it exactly the same. Negative camber, negative 1.25. That's much more reasonable. So that's good. I'll write that on my notes. Okay, these wheels are so polished, I'm having a hard time getting this gauge to stay put. So I've, I've put a string behind there, and I'm just going to loop this rubber band around, and then zip tie, just kind of zip tie it on there. There's the rubber band going behind the spoke of the wheel, and it's attached between these wing nuts. This gauge, or this fixture, is up tight against the wheel, and it's up tight against the wheel there, and then same is true over here. So now I'm able to get a caster measurement. So this is nice and level. That bubble right there is, is in the center. And then I think what I want to do is we adjust this to the middle. And then down here, I need to monitor this is at zero. So I'm going to use a, a hammer and just kind of tap that so this lines up to one of these lines. Right now I'm almost on this line and I'm off on this side. So I need to make sure this slip plate is zero because I wanna be able to turn the wheels 20 degrees. So if I'm already starting at three degrees, that's wrong. There we go. The steering wheel is effortless. Super easy to get this to turn. Really like these slip plates, it's working perfectly. So I think I got a little more to go. I think that is 20 degrees right there. All right there on the same line. And then I'm showing a caster of, I'm getting a little less than three. I'm gonna call it 2.9. And I'm not sure if it makes a difference if I turn the other way, but let's see what happens.
So that gives me a totally different number. That gives me a caster of five point two. So I got to read the directions on this. I'm not sure which way you're supposed to turn it, but I'm going to write this one down too. The other thing I'm going to do is just measure the, the ride height to the fender. There's more accurate ways to do this with the suspension stuff. So I'm going to set that up when I get it up on the lift, but this is measuring um, 24.75, actually 24 and 5 eighths. Okay. Things are a little different on my car because it has the Carrera flares, but I'm measuring the, the highest point is 24. The fender heights are very inconsistent. I got 24 on the left rear, 24 and a half on the right rear, 25 and an eighth on the right front, and 24 and three eighths on the left front. So this is really far out of whack, and it kind of makes sense with these numbers too, because the, these numbers are higher than these numbers. So what that means is it's kind of teetering like on a table. Let me show you my table. So, so here on my welding table, it's, um, you know, it's got rigid legs on the bottom. And depending on where I roll it, the ground is not exactly flat. So I, I can see the whole table will teeter totter. So in this case, the right front has a longer leg and the left rear has a longer leg. So right here, kind of like at a restaurant table, there's some space underneath here. So the most of the weight is being carried by the left rear and the right front. And that's kind of similar to my car. The distances are just out of whack. And so more of the weight is being carried by one of the tires than the other. And the idea of corner balancing is just kind of like um, at a restaurant, you put something underneath the table to make that leg longer. Well, we're gonna be doing that with the torsion bars. We're gonna adjust the torsion bars to make one of the legs longer. So each of the wheels are going to have the same weight distribution. So the diagonal weights will be the same. If the diagonal weights are the same, it won't teeter-totter. That teeter-tottering is what we don't want. Whether it's a work table or your Porsche, you don't want it to teeter on two wheels. <laughs> This is the bracket that I built mostly last time. I just added some uh, hockey stick tape. I had some of that left over from my wire harness on the 356. It works out great to protect the paint. This bracket is nice and firm to the car and uh, I can tighten these now. Just make sure nothing slides. These wing nuts are tight. So this support for the string is very important. You need to have repeatable string positions. As you make changes, the string has to be in the same place all the time. So this is a pretty rigid support. It's, uh, you know, I can pretty much move the whole car. I'm shaking the whole car right now with just the support for the strings. And that's why I spent so much time fabricating all this aluminum with this fancy stuff here on the, in the, the connections so it's adjustable and it's firm then the same is true here's the string same is true here on the front i'm just using a bolt to provide tension to the string it's it's located on that slot right there this frame is also um, coming up here against the bumpers i just got that block right there this frame is also pretty sturdy i'm shaking the whole car with it and i'm not really changing the string position once you take a measurement, you want to be very careful you don't bump into this. So you got to be careful if you bump into it, you may have to start over. But I've made it as strong as I can and as light as I can for a reason. I want it to be repeatable. If you look down the side of the car, the track width is a little wider on the rear than it is the front. There was a comment last week about an online tow calculator from Mark. And that's a, a really great find because what it does, it's similar to the Hunter uh, camera alignment machines. It calculates the center of the car for you based on all the measurements of all four wheels and the known wheelbase length. The wheelbase on the, this car is 89.4 inches. So if you know all that data, you can determine the center line of the car. Now I'm gonna do the center line of the car in, an, in another day. I'm gonna do a more rigorous uh, measurement of the center line of the car. 
because if I have something bent, uh, I'm not sure the online calculator will detect that. So I want to do my own investigation. But for now, I'm going to assume everything's good, not bent. And I want to get a baseline reading. So I'm going to use that online calculator without putting it up on the lift, finding the center of the car. I'm just going to use the calculator and see what I get. Hit 1.6. 1.37. There's going to be a long process of turning wrenches to get things back into spec. So at the top of the strut, there are some bolts you can undo. That's going to change the caster and the camber in the front. And then the, the tie rods will change the toe in. So that's adjustable in the front. That's easier to do with the lifts because I can get underneath there, make some changes, drop it back down onto the slip plates and see how it affects it. So it's going to be a long process up and down, checking the weights, checking the camber, all, everything's going to change everything else. So it's a long process of, it, of doing that. I am targeting the numbers that are on Ian's car. Um, we really like the way Ian's car drives, and I have the same tires as Ian, so the same alignment settings should get me really close to um, what I need for these particular tires. So it's nice to have Ian uh, sharing his numbers with me. He likes 1.7 in the rear. I have as much as, I have over three, so I'm way off on the camber. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, if you don't follow me on Instagram or Facebook, I have a third project going on simultaneous right now. I have the 356 project. I have this project, which is a semi driver. I've been driving it quite a bit. And I have a Jeep project, which is not here at my home. It is at the Peterson Museum. In collaboration with Peterson, there's a teen auto workshop program that I'm involved in. I am hosting that on their YouTube channel. If you haven't seen that on Instagram or Facebook, please check it out, All Garage Time on either one. And go to Peterson's YouTube channel. You can see the video. Video number two, I'll put a link uh, right here. Video number two is a complete suspension tear out and installing a new lift kit with springs and shocks and stuff. So we get into it pretty heavy. The Jeep is really coming along. Going to finish it up here in real time. It's going to be done probably in about two weeks and the videos will take a while to catch up, but it's been a fun project. And like I've always said, you know, build your dream car, get out, teach other people how to do that, share your work and motivate people to work on their car. And that's exactly why I took the opportunity at the Peterson. It is motivating other people to work on their car. Uh, the Jeep is a lot easier. We're getting a lot done in about eight, nine weeks, whereas this project has been like three years. And so there's a huge difference between working on a Jeep and bolting on parts and working on one of these. Go check it out. Take care.